As coronavirus cases explode all over the world, people are asking me, what can we do? What can I do? How can I avoid this? Will it go away in the summertime? And all of these sorts of questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Martinson. I'm here with your SARS-CoV-2 Honey Badger virus update for March 9th, 2020. I've titled this one Managing the Crisis because, as we're going to see in the numbers, it's pretty clear where we are right now. And markets are reacting very appropriately but badly, of course, to the idea uh, that there's massive, massive disruptions coming to a world that where financial asset prices had been priced for perfection. And obviously, this is anything but a perfect situation. So let's go to the numbers right now. And uh, very encouraging to see here South Korea's numbers. Remember, these were up in the 800s uh, not that long ago. And uh, still very low number of deaths and serious or critical cases. Very low relative to the total number of cases, probably due to two things. One, much, much more aggressive testing. So they have a much completer sample. I'm going to guess that this is we're going to from South Korea's data, we would draw the conclusion that overall, this thing is uh, coronavirus has far lower case fatality rates and uh, lower serious complication rates than we think, unless South Korea has a different strain. But we'll save that for another day because we don't have any evidence of that. But this is an interesting new column that Worldometers has started to put on here, which is total cases per 1 million of population. So you can see here, South Korea is all the way up at 145 cases per million population. United States, because of its very poor testing right now, is still uh, lagging on this uh, lowest on this whole chart, standing at just 1.9 identified cases per million of population. Yes, the United States is a few weeks behind South Korea in terms of this overall story, but um, this number is going to have to shoot up quite a bit. It would have enormous implications if it started to approach some of these other countries, you know, that are over 50. All right. Uh, Italy, their numbers didn't come in yet today. So I just pulled this. It's 1.40 p.m. right now, a couple minutes ago. They hadn't updated this yet for the day. Um, you can see they've got a pretty high rate going on here at 122 per million. lot of serious critical cases here and uh, very dire reports coming out of Italy in terms of the overwhelm of its hospital system. The number one thing that we wanted to avoid, and that's why I was arguing a long time ago, well over six weeks now, for things like travel bans and uh, uh, really intensive quarantines and things like that. Because this honey badger virus, it's just a beast. It's got an r naught. It's very high. It's, it's very transmissive, easily communicable. And it does have a serious complication rate, even if 80% are um, not serious cases, far, far too many of them are. And we'll get to what that looks like in just a second. Iran, I statistically speaking, uh, when you look at their actual numbers and you find out that they have 23 MPs who've caught this and the number of people who flew out of their country, who came back with it, uh, there's no way in heck Iran has 7,161 cases. In fact, uh, the statisticians, when they crunch the numbers, more likely Iran has about 2 million cases right now. And uh, that's from an article in The Atlantic that just came out today. And I can't tell you if that's true or not, but it feels a little bit closer to the right, given uh, how many cases have come out of Iran. A lot of cases have come out of France. France is also not updated yet. I think France has also a uh, failure to test going on as they test more and more. This number is going to go up. All their numbers are going to go up. Absolutely. Germany, a little late to the game uh, in terms of their own response to this, but they are climbing fast. And Spain just absolutely exploding here, moving up the charts very quickly with its plus 399 right there. So uh, as we watch this happen, uh, the conclusion is you are, if you do not have very active and aggressive containment measures right out of the gate, you're going to have a big medical emergency later on. Remember, there's that three-way balancing act. Do you contain the virus and stop the pandemic? Do you preserve your economy or do you risk overwhelming your hospital system? Those are the three variables that you have to play off against each other. A lot of countries in the West in particular have made the decision to spare their economy, not panic people, uh, put out soothing statements at the expense we're going to find out of what Italy has just discovered here, which is a fairly overwhelmed hospital system that we think can only get worse from here for at least a number of weeks until this burns a little bit. Uh, the Diamond Princess, mysteriously, back up to seven deaths here, um, still the same number of cases, so I'm not totally clear what's happening here. Um, this is the same number of series critical as yesterday, uh, or actually day before yesterday. Thank you. I took uh, yesterday off from this whole adventure right here, um, which was very healthy for me. I took a nice walk. It was good. Um, 
The United States is way behind on the testing platform. We don't, you know, it's going to take a while for this to catch up. But now that the states are busy testing and uh, private institutions, we're going to see a lot more cases uh, suddenly come up. That has to be combined with active contact tracing to slow it down. Japan, working very hard to convince everybody that they don't have a big raging outbreak. I'm not sure how that can be. Um, This is also very low. They're also doing fairly low levels of testing. And uh, Netherlands, just to single them out for a second, really, really poor information kind of coming out of RIVM from time to time. I mean, really astonishingly uh, poor information, uh, including saying things like, you know, the, the virus doesn't live very long um, in a, and things like that, which we also got from a U.S. official. I'll cover that in just a second. So here's one big thing that's come out where people said, well, maybe it'll go away in summer, you know, just like the flu. Can we count on that? And so here what we're looking at is the standard H1N1 flu, uh, positive tests reported to the CDC. So these are of people who got tested from April 24th, that's week 17 right here, to November 27th. This is back in 2009. Um, So that's week 48. So this is April to November. And you can see that you've got this first peak in here right now. So that's somewhere in May. And then it, it lulls down and then you have your harder peak out here in October. So the idea of it going away, it's not really true. It reduces. You can see that, but it doesn't go away. So let's just say this is about 1,000 cases right here. Yeah, it's one-fifth because that's 5,000 and uh, maybe one-tenth as much. That's 9,000, but it doesn't go away. It just gives you a lull, a respite, um, which if coronavirus behaves anything like the flu, we might see something like this and, uh, of course, be ready for a fall wave as well. And I have no idea if it would be any worse or better. I, I don't know. This is H1N1, totally different virus from the coronavirus. I'm just, I'm just saying this is uh, the kind of data that we do have uh, that would suggest there is a seasonality to this thing. All right. Um, this was really important data. Really glad to come, come across this. I've been following Helen Branswell at Helen Branswell on Twitter. This just came out today on March 9th. Uh, like this. Uh, it's a, it's data. Um, people shed high levels of coronavirus study finds, but most are likely not infectious after the recovery begins. So remember, we were a little bit worried that, you know, there's the asymptomatic period up front. Are people infectious during that? Yes, we've got data to suggest very strongly that people are infectious during the asymptomatic incubation period. Of course, they are transmissive while they're showing symptoms. They're coughing, they're wheezing, they got fevers, all of that stuff, of course. But the question um, was standing out there. We asked it a few weeks ago uh, first, which was, um, well, what about these people showing high viral loads after they've recovered from their symptoms? Are those still transmissive infective particles? Because again, you could be testing for those, find them, find the iron RNA. But if your body's made antibodies, maybe those virus particles are completely coated with antibodies and they're no longer infective. So good study here. Let's take a quick peek. So it says here, people who contract the novel coronavirus emit high amounts of virus very early on in their infection, according to a new study from Germany. Okay. So this, this is really important, the high amounts of virus very early in their infection, right? So that could include, and I believe it does in this case, the uh, asymptomatic period. And this helps to uh, explain the rapid and efficient way in which the virus has spread around the world. At the same time, the study suggests that while people with mild infections can still test positive by throat swabs for days or even weeks after their illness, those who are only mildly sick are likely not still infectious by about 10 days after they start to experience symptoms. So if you started to experience symptoms, you have one of the more mild cases, about 10 days after that, you're not infectious. So this gives us an idea of a quarantine time, which says, hey, if somebody first starts to have symptoms and it's mild, you're going to want them to be out of contact with other people for about 10 days. In fact, let's just draw it right there and say, Minimum 10 days. Okay, this was a study by scientists in Berlin and Munich. It's uh, one of the first outside China to look at clinical data from patients who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. And one of the first to try and map when people infected with the virus can infect others. Super important. Been waiting for this data. Glad to find it. This was published on Monday in a preprint server, meaning it's not yet been peer-reviewed. But hey, uh, you know what? We got to go with that stuff uh, early on. Uh, because uh, what are you going to do? You can't, wait for, you can't wait for peer review in a situation like this. So I'm going with this. This is a very important contribution to understanding both the natural history of COVID-19 clinical disease as well as the public health impl- implications of 
Viral Shedding. This is from Michael Olsterholm, very respected director of the University of Minnesota Center for Infectious Disease and Research Policy. So I agree. Um, glad Michael confirmed that. Very important contribution here. Here's what they did. The researchers monitored the viral shedding of nine people infected with the virus. In addition to tests looking for fragments of the virus's RNA, they also tried to grow viruses from sputum, blood, urine, stool samples taken from the patients. The latter type of testing, trying to grow viruses, is critical in the quest to determine how people infect one another and how long an infected person poses a risk to others. Importantly, the scientists could not grow viruses from throat swabs or sputum specimens after day eight of illness from people who had mild infections. So we don't have any data yet on people who have serious infections. Uh, maybe they're the same, maybe they're different, but at least now we have, this covers the 80% crowd, I guess. Based on the present findings, early discharge with ensuing home isolation could be chosen for patients who are beyond day 10 of symptoms with less than 100,000 viral RNA copies per mil of sputum, um, suggesting at that point there is little residual risk of infectivity based on cell culture. So good to know. Um, that's really, really good to know. All right. Uh, one of the things, though, to really understand why people are struggling with uh, getting their arms around this, and sometimes they're, they're, they're very well-placed, uh, very intelligent people, they're, but all of us, I think, are struggling with this idea of how, how do you even cope with something that's growing exponentially, right? Because that's what this disease is doing right now. It's growing exponentially. So um, I put this out a number of 10 over, oh gosh, 2008. So whatever that is, 12 years ago now, this is part of my crash course series. And in it, I'm explaining a variety of concepts that build towards an idea. But this is the power of compounding. Let's uh, bring that up right now. And let's play this. So this chapter is to help you understand the power of compounding. If something grows over time, such as population, demand for oil, money supply, really anything that steadily increases in size, and you graph it over time, the graph will look like a hockey stick. If something is increasing over time on a percentage basis, it's growing exponentially. Using an example drawing on the magnificent work of Dr. Albert Bartlett, let me illustrate the power of compounding for you. Suppose I had a magic eyedropper and I placed a single drop of water in the middle of your left hand. The magic part is that this drop of water is going to double in size every minute. At first, nothing seems to be happening. But by the end of a minute, that tiny drop is now the size of two tiny drops. After another minute, you now have a little pool of water that is slightly smaller in diameter than a dime sitting in your hand. After six minutes, you have enough water to fill a thimble. Now, suppose we take our magic eyedropper to Yankee Stadium, and right at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, we place a magic drop way down there on the pitcher's mound. To make this really interesting, suppose that the park is watertight and that I handcuff you to one of the very highest bleacher seats. My question to you is, how long do you have to escape from the handcuffs? When would the stadium be completely filled with water? Would it be days, weeks, months, years? How long would that take? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. The answer is you have until 12.50 on that same day to figure out how you're going to get out of those handcuffs. In 50 minutes, our modest little drop of water has completely managed to fill Yankee Stadium. Now let me ask you the more important question. At what time of the day would Yankee Stadium still be 93% empty space, and how many of you would realize the seriousness of your predicament? Any guesses? The answer is 12.45. If you were sitting idly in your bleacher seat waiting for help to arrive, by the time the field was covered with less than five feet of water, you would only have five minutes left to get free. And that right there illustrates one of the key features of compound growth. The one thing I want you to take away from all this is, with exponential functions, the action really only heats up in the last few moments. You sat in your bleacher seat for 45 minutes and nothing much seemed to be happening. And then in four minutes, bang! The whole place was full. This example was loosely based on a wonderful paper by Dr. Albert Bartlett that clearly and cleanly describes this process of compounding. Dr. Bartlett said, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is the inability to understand the exponential function. And he's absolutely right. All right. I totally agree with Dr. Albert Bartlett. As a quick aside, I, I, he's like the world preeminent uh, 
person to, to learn exponential growth from. Uh, you can look up his stuff on YouTube. Really, really incredible seminal series there. He's got one lecture that just nails it. And and I heard that and I refashioned that into that example that I just used here that with the stadium. And uh, quick aside, one time I was in Boulder, Colorado, 2009, I was given a talk and he was in the audience and I was explaining exponential growth to to the person I most revered. It was like having the Dalai Lama sit in the third row and I was talking about spirituality. It was kind of a uh, a, a nerve-wracking moment for me, but, but also an honor to have him there. And I really want to point out his incredible work. So now that we understand that idea of exponential growth, we are in minute 45 to 48 in this story. Again, Singapore, Hong Kong doing these really incredible jobs, contact tracing really aggressively, testing, testing, testing. And they, of course, are getting a very flat line. This is a linear growth in cases right here. That's what they get to enjoy. Whereas all these countries who didn't test, didn't test, didn't test, didn't test, hey, wash your hands. Uh-oh, we're out of face masks, right? All of these countries, you now know what the shape of this is that you're looking at here, right? These are all the same shape. These are all growing exponentially. Now, uh, the thing about exponential charts and, and things like this, and this isn't, I'm not meaning to do a math lecture here, but it's a really important concept, is that this is on a linear chart. So this y-axis goes 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on. Of course, we could put this on an exponential axis over here or a log chart, and it gives us easier to grasp information. Thanks, uh, Ken Stanfield over here with um, uh, all these great charts. These are just, these are very helpful. All right. Uh, let's look at the X China doubling times. This is on a logarithmic chart. So you see here it goes 400, 1K, 2,000, 4,000, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000. So that's a log chart right there. And we start here at one I can see easily. So this is starting at 1,000. I put a little blue uh, triangle right there. And the question is, well, how long before it made it to the 2,000 line? And that was about five days here, right? One, two, three, four, five. Five days later outside of China, because I, you know, I can't trust the China numbers, who knows, right? But outside of China, I think we're, we're starting to get a handle on this. And so the known cases outside of China was five days. And again, flaws outside of China too, which includes the idea that the United States and other countries not testing as much as they should have, um, or we would like them to. How about the next doubling where we go from 2,000 to 4,000? That was just four days. And how about the next doubling? Well, that, that was only a little over th that's three days, um, a little over three days, maybe three and a half days because it actually crosses. Well, this would be the 8,000 mark. It's hard to see. This is 10, 8,000. Yeah, three days. What about the next doubling? Well, that would have gone from eight to 16,000. That's going to be mm, somewhere right around where I've got that thing marked. That would be one, two, three, three and a half, almost call it four days, right? Where's the next one? I don't know, because we're not there yet. Um, I need the March 9th data to show up. Um, but it's probably looks like it's going to be on track for about four days because we would want to be making it to about 36,000, which would be, yeah, right about there. Um, so at any rate, we are seeing, let's just average this out and call it four days, right? Uh, we are seeing doubling times right now outside of China of about four days. So this is a really critical concept, and this is why we're going to see hospital systems get overwhelmed and overloaded because this stuff is growing exponentially. It's part of the reason, too, I don't trust the test data because if you can make 1,000 tests per week and then you can make 2,000, but then you really crank up your manufacturing and testing and you can go to 3,000 tests a week, you're still growing linearly, and this thing, this beast of a honey badger virus is going to grow on you exponentially. Very, very hard to keep your um, testing up with uh, something that's growing exponentially. So at any rate, um, that's what we're seeing right now. And so this brings up an important idea, which is this idea of herd immunity, which is when do enough people actually have circulating antibodies in their, in their bodies so that this thing can stop uh, on its own? So that's naturally how viruses get stopped in any population, whether it's starfish or sparrows or humans. So let's talk about herd immunity real quick. Uh, decode this first. Blue, blue people. And anywhere you see a blue person means they're not immunized, but they're still healthy. So they either haven't received an immunization vaccine shot or they haven't been exposed to and recovered from a specific virus. So they're not immunized, but still healthy. If you're yellow, you're immunized and healthy, right? And if you're red, you're not immunized, but you're sick and contagious, okay? So here in a place where nobody is immunized, which is the case that we have with this coronavirus, there's no herd immunity. No one is immunized because we don't have a vaccine. No one's seen it before. So one person can spread it to a lot of people 
And the contagious disease spreads really rapidly and easily through this population until there's just very few blue people left over here. Almost everybody's been exposed and got it. Um, Alternatively, uh, we could ask the question, well, what happens if if 10% of the population is immunized? So that's these yellow people. It's about 1 in 10 if you count them up. So now this virus jumps into this population, ding, ding. And what happens? Boom. Same thing. Um, Contagious disease spreads right through the population. So it turns out there's some magic number of immunized people you need before you achieve this thing called herd immunity. Here's herd immunity here. Lots of immunized and healthy people. So when this disease jumps in, well, it might get this one here. See, this person turned red. But it couldn't get all the way over to this person who is then protected right? And, um, you know, this person tried to spread it, but they're completely surrounded, so there was nowhere to go. So uh, these people are protected. So the question becomes, well, how much of our population has to be immunized or otherwise uh, immunologically healthy uh, and, you know, with with circulating um, antibodies against this thing in their body? So the answer is there's a relationship between the r naught and herd immunity here. So the herd immunity. So let's look at mumps because I think that this, the R naught for this particular disease is clocking in around four to seven, and it says your threshold percent. Okay, which is what's the threshold number? What percent of people have to be yellow in this picture in order to get um, basically herd immunity so that you have a chance of stopping something between four and seven? Well, but four, it's about seventy-five percent. If it's got an R naught of seven, it's about eighty-six percent. So when we say 60% of the world might be infected by this thing in, in, you know, in a year, we still haven't made it to the threshold immunity level for this particular piece uh, of this virus for it not to spread. Now, obviously, if people have immunity, it's not going to spread to them, we hope. Um, again, we hope there's no secondary infection. But this whole idea that if enough people catch it, um, then we have herd immunity, I just need you to know it doesn't happen until at least three quarters of the world uh, has, has been exposed to it. And it's good that 80% of the people who get it, uh, of course, are, have mild symptoms because that gives us a chance. We'll get there. We, we will get a threshold percentage at some point, but not this spring, probably not this fall. It'll probably be a couple of years. All right. Here's why I want to talk to you about these protective measures, the, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, the NPIs, why they matter so much. Um, I like the way this chart puts it. So listen, with or without protective measures, you're, you're still going to have just as many people get the disease. But without protective measures, what happens is you get this big blob of people who come all at once. And if those number of cases exceed your healthcare system capacity, a lot of people unnecessarily die. Okay. If you can shift the curve to the right, you heard me say that a couple of times recently. That's what this means. We've shifted the curve to the right. Okay. If you can do that, you do that by making sure that the disease spreads a lot more slowly through your population. You do a lot of aggressive social distancing. You cancel large events, all that stuff, right? That gets you there. And the reason this is so important, let's go to Italy's experience because um, I think Italy's experience is about to be mirrored by a lot of other countries who just didn't get on the ball fast enough and are now facing this. Whereas Singapore, Hong Kong, they shifted their curves through very aggressive measures, which, again, cost their economy a little bit, but it's going to save a lot of lives. So Italy's experience is this. So Antonio Pacenti, 68, the coordinator of the Lombardy Region Crisis Unit, super, super well-respected guy. Um, uh, They call him one of the um, best Italian men of science. He's a physician, resuscitator, strong nerves, accustomed to governing by any type of emergency. I mean, he's one of the people you'd want to have in charge, something like this. But at 9 o'clock on Saturday evening, after 17 days of nonstop work, his voice is broken by tiredness and worry. If the population does not understand that they must stay at home, the situation will become catastrophic. So with poor communication, which wasn't Antonio's job, by the way, that was the government's job, they announced a quarantine, but it leaked out and all these people scattered and ran away from the Lombardy region, taking trains, planes, buses, bicycles, cars, anything they could to get out of there before the quarantine was slapped down because they didn't want to be there trapped under a quarantine. The population didn't understand what their role was in all of this. And so they scattered. And so, you know, he, I, he's right. If the population does not understand that they must stay at home, the situation will become catastrophic. This is cat catastrophe right up here. Okay. Um, 
So uh, let's see. Uh, she, I don't know who this is because I just cl- cut this out. Somebody. Um, together with her colleagues and the reanimations is the author of a very harsh letter to the government of Gisa Picante. The scientific projections are very alarming. What do you mean by that? And then the answer here was the picture is of such gravity as to require an increase in resuscitation places up to 10 times the current availability So this is hospital capacity. The number of hospitalized patients expected on March 26 is around 18,000 Lombard patients. So that's in, what, 26? That's in 17 days from now. Of which, between 2,700 and 3,200 will require hospitalization in intensive care. Today, there are already over 1,000 patients between those in resuscitation and those who risk getting worse from one minute to the next. We monitor the situation 24 hours a day. They're already overloaded here um, at, at this. Uh, they're already overloaded and they haven't even gotten to this right here. Thinking of having to manage 2,700 to 3,200 people in intensive care. They have a fraction of that many beds. It's, it's very alarming. Um, so continuing so far in Lombardy, the ambulances have always arrived in eight minutes, but now they risk not arriving within an hour a huge danger for those who have a heart attack, say. Um, And not only unfortunate, I don't know where that goes. Unfortunately, it is the truth. I'm not saying this to alarm citizens, but make everyone understand that it's not the time to go out, to go shopping, to go and drink the spritz, as we've been saying for days now. Social relations must be changed, must be changed with the shops and neighborhood markets closed. In Milan, where I live, at least so far, there have been too many people needlessly around. You only have to go out to buy food. And wear your masks, wear your goggles, make sure that you're washing your hands and using hand sanitizer and all of that stuff, right? So this is really, uh, this is a very urgent sort of a communication from somebody who really knows and is talking about these non-pharmaceutical interventions. And remember, it was in Taiwan that said carrot and the stick, but the stick in this story was if they caught you breaking quarantine, it was something like up to five years in jail. I can't remember, five months. It was something pretty harsh in it, like a two million um, Taiwanese dollar uh, fine, like a hundred grand. Like if you're caught breaking quarantine, contrast that with the United States where this just came out today on March 9th. Um, There was this family they were in quarantine. The dad was in quarantine. He decided, you know what, he'd rather attend the father-daughter dance at the local school, and now the school's closed. You know, oops. And, and here in the United States, the response was, if you do that like that again, we might have to involuntarily quarantine you, right? But in Taiwan, this guy had been put um, in jail, and he'd be facing a massive fine. That's what you have to do. All right. I want to repeat this because I'm getting a lot of pushback from people who tell me that I'm, I'm being alarmist, and I'm just here with facts. And Uh, I know this is hard. I know this is difficult. I know everybody's going to have a different adjustment process. I'm sensitive to the idea that I do have a very fast adjustment process when it comes to these things and others don't. But if the facts alarm you, the problem isn't with the facts. We all have to go through this adjustment process. I'm going to make that uh, one of the features of one of these next uh, videos I'm going to put out because it's a super important concept. And uh, it's listen, I'm not saying anybody's better or worse or nobody's bad because they have a slow adjustment process. It's a necessary, necessary process to go through, but it's an emotional process. It has nothing to do with the facts. And maybe you know somebody who's having trouble um, dealing with the facts. It's not the facts that they're having trouble with. However, uh, if you <laughs> if bad communication alarms you, you probably live in the United States. Remember, don't panic, don't panic, don't panic. And then you get this sort of thing like screaming across the newswire. U.S. urges elderly to stock up on groceries, prepare to stay at home, all caps. You know, like this is not helpful. It didn't have to be this way. We could have easily um, done this differently. In fact, where's the program to help the elderly uh, with a home delivery of groceries, uh, you know, a, a more healthy, sane Heart-centered culture, I think, would have not done it this way. You know, Brad put it well. Stay calm, everyone. But we'll just hit you randomly with a headline like this one, you know, from time to time. Boom. Uh, Not helpful. Or maybe we'll listen to this clown. And I told myself, Chris, don't don't hit the who anymore. It's not helping. Let's just get with the positive stuff. Let's talk about what people can do. But then the who comes out here today at 1217 on March 19th and says, you know, now that the coronavirus has a foothold in so many countries, the threat of a pandemic has become very real. What in the heck? But it would be the first pandemic in history that could be controlled. No, 
could have been past tense there, Tedros. And the bottom line is we are not at the mercy of this virus. Well, they're all very uplifting, very uplifting. What do you mean the threat of a pandemic has become very real? Dude, this thing's raging and breaking hospital systems all over the globe right now. It, uh, okay, very frustrated with that. All right. Um, this whole thing, I have to add one more thing. Uh, it's in the long bullet points of things we think we know about this particular coronavirus. Patients with mild cases are no longer infective 10 days after first symptoms. That's a really important additive to this story that we can add to all of these other things that we now know about this particular virus. And again, not peer-reviewed. A couple other things on here are not peer-reviewed, but this is the best we know at this point in time. All right, let's talk about bad info, the New York City edition. Here was the New York City mayor, de Blasio, coming out in a presser, and he said, it does not live on surfaces for more than a few minutes. It's not airborne. And uh, that, of course, is completely wrong. We covered this data a number of days ago. So so let's combat that because maybe some of you are first-time listeners. So here's the data. Good info. This is the data rich edition. This comes from um, the Journal of Hospital Infection. Here's the URL for this thing right here. Persistence of coronaviruses on inanimate surfaces and their inactivation with biocidal agents. So where are the punchlines? These things can live on surfaces like metal, glass, or plastic up to nine days. Now, this isn't the coronavirus per se, but it's something darn close, which is the SARS virus, which they tested the MERS virus, which they tested, and also the human coronaviruses um, like this one, which causes uh, gastric enteritis. All right, uh, nine days, up to nine days. Where's this person, where's the mayor of New York City getting their information? Does not live on surfaces more than a few minutes. That is just absolutely not what the data says. This is the gold standard. This is a meta study, looked at 22 other studies uh, right there and um, and, uh, came to these conclusions as well. All you need to know is that if you are going to um, disinfect something, 62 to 71% ethanol. I've seen some of you talking about homemade hand sanitizer. You're starting with 70% uh, isopropyl alcohol. Uh, you can't do that because once you cut that, you're getting below that 70, the 62 mark. So you got to make sure, calculate your percentages. If you're going to make hand sanitizer at home, I support that. Make sure you stay in this range if you can, because this is the range that denatures the proteins in the viruses, inactivates them. Pure ethanol doesn't do that. It could kill them for other reasons, but this is one of the most effective ranges right here. We know it works, 62 to 71. Or half a percent hydrogen peroxide, or my fave, 0.1% sodium hypochlorite, that's bleach. Inactivates within one minute, okay? So not impossible to kill. Uh, It's not a super, 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 you know, impossible thing. You just gotta, you gotta be on it and you gotta know what it's all about. But let's cover this idea. Does, yes, should you wash your hands? Yes, yes. Pally Thordson um, wrote this really great uh, tweet. God, look at that. 31,000, 34,000 retweets, 56,000 likes. I, I love it. People caught this and spread it all around. She answers the question in this. Uh, this is one of 25. So there's a lot of data under here, but I'm just going to give you the top part of this. Why does soap work so well on the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, and indeed most viruses? Because it is a self-assembled nanoparticle. Here it is in which the weakest link is the lipid fatty bilayer. That's that's these little, you can see them, these little, those little grayish things down there. Um, so when you, what's a soap? Well, a soap is a, um, it's a fat uh, coupled to a charged end and the fat comes in and works on this fatty bilayer and breaks it up. So when you wash your hands with soap, what you're doing is ruining its outer coat Um, membrane that holds the whole thing together and it just falls apart, okay? Um, The soap dissolves the fat membrane and the virus falls apart like a house of cards and dies, or rather we should say becomes inactive as viruses aren't really alive, sort of, but we don't know. Um, They don't replicate themselves. Big debate about that, but I think she's, I'll go with it. Viruses can remain active outside the body for hours, even days, maybe nine days, Mayor de Blasio, right? Disinfectants or liquids, wipes, gels, and creams containing alcohol and soap have similar effects but are not really quite as good as normal soap. Apart from the alcohol and soap, the antibacterial agents in these products don't really affect the virus structure much at all because those are antibacterial and we're talking viruses, bacteria and viruses, totally different life forms or one's a life form, one sort of isn't. That's the virus. Consequently, many antibacterial products are basically just an expensive version of soap in terms of how they act on viruses. Soap is the best. But alcohol wipes are pretty good when soap is not practical or handy. 
say, office receptions. All right. So wash your hands. How do we avoid being infected? We're going to add two things to our list from the other day. Of course, we're going to start with avoid all gatherings, large or small. Just avoid them. That's it. That's how you stop this thing. Social distancing, number one, best solution to stopping any viral infection, social distancing. People have asked me, though, when do I come out of my own uh, self-isolation, which I am in right now because we have this endemic in my region, and my strategy is to not get it and not be a drain on my local hospital system. So that's what I'm going to do. My litmus test, though, is that once everyone is wearing a mask out when out and about, this idea can be relaxed a bit. So once everybody's wearing a mask, then I'm more comfortable because, of course, I don't know who's asymptomatic carrying and all of that. And and a mask mostly prevents a sick person from spreading it much more uh, well than it does prevent a sick person, a a well person from um, uh, stopping the intrusion of a virus. So we want, as soon as everybody's wearing one, it's fine. Just like Hong Kong. And by the way, Hong Kong, awesome data. They've absolutely not only crushed uh, the spread of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but they've also crushed ordinary seasonal flu. So big learnings coming out of there, which is, yes, we can do something about it. Dr. Tedros is right. We absolutely can't. Where did, where did that part go? He's right. Uh, I forget. I lost him already. That's okay. Don't need to bring him back. Um, but we can do something about it. Uh, but first, we've got to get the social distancing down and we've got to get the social practices in of making sure everybody understands their role in maintaining quarantine, not going out when they're sick, putting a mask on when they're out in public. All right. But we're going to add to uh, all this other stuff, which I read through the other time. You can read it yourself is wash your hands. Yeah, that's how you avoid being infected. Wash your hands with soap, ordinary soap, nothing fancy, ivory soap, whatever soap. I'll be good. I hate to say it too, but um, one way to avoid being infective is uh, avoid listening to certain public officials. And fortunately, many of them that are giving out what I consider to be inexcusably bad in information. Okay. All right. The markets are in complete meltdown mode right now. Uh, I just pulled this a second ago. The uh, Dow down 1600 points, uh, you know, 6.28%. Oh my God. The Russell down 7%. Uh, it's happening. The DAX is down 8%, 19% still 19 and percent crude oil, just shellac, just crushed. This is going to have huge repercussions. Bonds screaming higher, of course, and that means the yields are dropping. Unbelievable price there on the 30 year bond, which dropped below a percent. Unbelievable. I can't believe any of this. It's just keep a journal. This is astonishing. Um, gold kind of holding up um, compared to everything else. And so, uh, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about this. The economic impacts, I think, are going to be uh, the thing that hurts more people, honestly, directly than the virus itself um, on a long term basis. So I'm going to be focusing a lot more on that. But these videos have been about the health side. It's about understanding the virus. It's about understanding transmission, about communicability. I'm going to keep these videos that way, but there are also going to be another series of videos coming out, and you'll find those at peakprosperity.com if you're interested in figuring out and learning about um, all the market impacts and how we decode this and look at uh, those as well. All right. Conclusions for today. Hey, we are nowhere remotely close to achieving herd immunity. Might be a full year or two before we get even close to that, depending on how fast this spreads. Summer won't be without SARS-CoV-2, just quieter, we hope. Of course, this could be different. It could be maybe completely gone by summer because SARS-CoV-2 is different, or maybe it's still with us. We don't know. But we hope that it, it, it will be mostly gone. Exponential growth, vital. It's really vital you understand it. Rewatch that little video clip again if you need to. The doubling times X China are running about four days at present. No idea when that's going to slow down. Don't know that yet. Markets are in the process of bursting, which uh, they're bursting a very ill-advised third everything bubble that the central banker has fostered or blew. Shame on them for that. Um, I've had a lot of commentary about that over the years. Remember, the disease progression of this is case, 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 cluster, cluster, boom. And uh, yesterday, or actually the day before yesterday, I said, man, somebody should turn that into a t-shirt. Hey, somebody did. Now with Schwag, the Case, 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 Cluster, Cluster, Boom series here uh, by Jake Stollery. Well done, Jake, for uh, jumping out on that. I, I really admire um, uh, all sorts of uh, entrepreneurship. And I have uh, zero connection with this or Jake. I've never met him before. No financial arrangement. I'm just putting this out there because... I love seeing entrepreneurship as well. Remember to resubscribe if you need to, because uh, people are still getting unsubscribed and unsubbed from this thing. And uh, yeah, that's happening a bunch. So at any rate, with that, just resubscribe. And uh, that's all I have for you today. We'll be back tomorrow. Hi, folks. Adam Taggart here. Chris Martinson and I are the co-founders of Peak Prosperity. 
If you want to get alerted whenever we release a new video from Chris, just click the red subscribe button right beneath the YouTube video player. Once you've done that, a little bell icon will appear right next to it. Click on that bell. It looks like this. And that's it. The next time we publish a video from Chris, you'll immediately receive a notification from YouTube. Thanks for watching our videos.